So this video is definitely for you. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna give you my top five reasons to invest in Medellin real estate right now. And that's as of 2019. So let's dive right into it. My first reason for investing in Medellin real estate is to diversify your real estate portfolio out of the dollar. And that's not to say that you should have 100% of your assets denominated in other currencies. I'm just saying that there should be some diversification. Personally, I like a 50-50 split. For you, you might like 10%, 90%, 80 20 But whatever it is, I strongly suggest having some diversification in your portfolio, not only between bonds, stocks, and real estate or gold, but also with the currency that those assets are denominated in. Let's go into our first chart here. And that is a chart of the US dollar going back about 10 years. And I really wanna focus on this area right here in 2014. You can see how the dollar was extremely low, not at its uh, absolute low in the last 10 years, but it was low, dipped down under 80. And then you can see here at 2017, how it got uh, to about 104. And now it is at 96. And just to uh, explain here, the higher this chart goes, the stronger the dollar is relative to a, bas a basket of other currencies. So again, 2014, the dollar is really weak. Let's go to our next chart, which is the US dollar versus the Colombian peso. And that's going back here to about 2014. You can see in 2014 how the peso was about 1850 per dollar, which means the peso was very strong, the dollar was very weak. Now you can see the peso is about 3200, which means it is extremely weak against the dollar, or what I would say is that the dollar is extremely expensive and the peso is very cheap. And you can see how we've uh, stayed up around, you know, the 3000 mark for quite some time. And it kind of just had this hockey stick up from 2014 up to a high point in 2016. And this was right about the time when oil got down below $30 a barrel. And I'll, the peso, one of the strong cro cross currents that affects the peso is the price of oil. So when oil goes down below 30 or when it just goes down, that's really going to push or create a headwind for the peso. But that's not what I want to focus on entirely. Let's get into the next chart where we look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Now, this is, in essence, how much or how many dollars, how much money the Fed has actually printed to buy assets. The Fed can't make money. It doesn't uh, do anything. It doesn't produce anything. It has no way of making profit other than printing money or creating money out of thin air, buying assets. And then if it gets a return on those assets, then that is a way for it to make profit. But it doesn't produce anything. So the only way it has purchasing power is creating dollars out of thin air. That may shock some of you, but it's actually true, believe it or not. So you can see in 2012, right around here, that's when that dollar was actually around 75, extremely low. And this is when everyone was really concerned that the printing of those dollars or the creation of those dollars with the quantitative easing program that the Fed was implementing, uh, implementing along with 0% interest rates and negative interest rates across a lot of the countries in the developed uh, economies, that that would really create downward pressure on pretty much all the major currencies, including the dollar. And that's why when you get to this 2012, this 2013, 14, you can see how all these dollars are being printed to buy assets to put on the Fed's balance sheet. And that was really pushing that dollar down against the peso specifically. And then you can see what happened when the Fed started to level off their or stop their uh, quantitative easing program. That's right about 2014, 2015, when if we go back to the peso, you'll see that it started to dip, depreciate quite heavily against the dollar. It started to get really cheap because people thought, ah, the Fed stopped the money printing and we haven't seen any hyperinflation. So that means that the, that the dollar is going to get stronger which it absolutely did. And the dollar stayed at kind of a high level all the way until 
uh, until now when it's about 96 or so, which historically speaking is very high or expensive. Is, uh, that's the way I like to look at it, cheap and expensive. Well, if you've been listening to the Fed recently, you've noticed that they have turned what they call dovish. And that means that the Fed is getting loose with their monetary policy. They're thinking about lowering rates, actually. Uh, we're already down at 2.5%, but they've talked about decreasing them. They're worried about the yield curve flattening. I won't go into that, but that basically is uh, an indicator for the United States economy potentially going into a recession. So that's why they're talking about lowering rates. And they've actually talked about doing a fourth round of quantitative easing. That means printing a lot more money or creating a, a much bigger supply of dollars than is already out there. So this balance sheet, if we take the Fed at its word, or we look at how much debt the United States has now with uh, you know Obama, I think he almost doubled the debt and Trump as well on his way to, to doing that. So my point is that the Fed most likely is gonna be increasing its balance sheet in the very near future. Well, what happened when they increased their balance sheet back in 2012, 2013, 14? The peso went all the way down to 1850. And it's not to say that that's guaranteed to happen again. That in investing and especially in, currents, in currencies, there's so many cross currents that affect the currencies that there's just no way that you can be certain. But there are probabilities and the probability is extremely high that if the Fed increases their balance sheet, the peso will appreciate heavily against the United States dollar. So if you have 100% of your assets denominated in US dollars, well, that's great right now, but what happens if the dollar goes back down to 80 or 75, which it was just six years ago? That means your purchasing power goes down dramatically. So who cares if your assets are appreciating, if your purchasing power that you could get from the value of those assets is actually decreasing. And this really holds true for people who are planning on retiring outside of the United States, i.e. Medellin or Colombia. Fantastic place to retire, that's a different video. But if you're planning on retiring down here, you're your bills and expenses are gonna be denominated in pesos. Well, what happens if all your assets are in dollars, if your uh, pension or your monthly social security check that's coming in is denominated in dollars and the dollar goes from, uh, or the peso goes from 13, uh, uh, 3,200, excuse me, pesos per dollar down to 1850. That means your purchasing power almost gets cut in half. Now, if you're doing what I suggested, and if you have half your portfolio denominated in dollars, also half your portfolio denominated in, uh, in pesos or in other currencies, then you're gonna be hedged, and if the dollar does go down to these 80, 75 levels, then the side of your portfolio or the portion of your portfolio that's denominated in other assets will increase, theoretically, pretty much, or hopefully, the same amount as the dollar side decreased in purchasing power. So just like, you know, we all know growing up that's, that that's the only free lunch on Wall Street is diversification. And as Americans, we get to the mindset that that just means, okay, well, I have to have a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, real estate. Maybe if I'm super, super diversified, I'll get into gold or precious metals. But we never th think about the fact that those uh, assets are all denominated in the same currency. So I think you get it. I don't want to beat a dead horse. And if you have any other questions, please make sure that you leave those in the comments because I know that the macro stuff can get a little bit high level and hard to understand for us uh, real estate investors if you don't geek out on it like, uh, like I do. Let's move on to the next uh, reason why I think that you should invest in Medellin real estate right now. And that is better ROI or return on investment. When I was flipping houses in the United States, I flipped uh, well over 40 homes in the United States since 2012. I would be very satisfied if I got a 15 to 25% return per flip. And in Medellin, I can get anywhere between 20 and even pushing 40%, sometimes even a little bit higher than that if I really, really, really get a good buy. 
So the although you can't use any leverage here, it's very difficult to unless you leverage your equity in the United States. And, and again, that's another video. But you can't just get a Colombian based mortgage from the local bank. So it is cash based. But even with those cash returns, you're getting um, uh, a cash on cash return of something that would be equivalent of using uh, leverage in the United States. And if you just compare it or if you exclude the leverage, to have an apples to apples comparison using straight cash in the United States or straight cash here, the return on your investment here is going to be substantially higher. Okay. Now, and, and then also I wanted to mention rents too. Excuse me. Uh, the long term rents here you can get, or what I'm seeing with my uh, portfolio is about eight to 12%. And in the United States, I'm lucky if I get six or eight percent. So not only can you get a higher ROI with flips here, but also on the long term rental side, you can get higher yields. All right. My third reason for investing in Medellin real estate. And that is because right now it is dirt cheap in dollars. And I mean, really cheap, which is crazy because I go on a lot of these, uh, you know, kind of gringo Facebook forums and everyone talks about in Poblado where I really like to buy how it's a bubble and it's just wildly expensive. I really don't know what they're talking about. Maybe uh, maybe if you want to pay gringo prices, it's expensive. But the stuff that I'm buying, it sure isn't expensive. And it's in the primo, primo spots in Medellin and in Poblado, close to Parqueras close to the golden mile. So let's just go into, uh, I can say it's cheap, but what does that mean? So first and foremost, I like to start off with comparing things to the United States. So back in 2012 is when I started investing in real estate and I really leaned heavily on this chart. I really relied heavily on this chart. And this is a chart of the United States housing prices going back to 1970 in nominal and in real terms. Real means adjusted for the rate of inflation, which is the only thing I care about. People talk about nominal and it just doesn't even make any sense to me because who cares if your uh, home appreciates by 20% if you lose 20% of your purchasing power in the, in the currency that the, uh, that the home is denominated in. You're still at a, at a wash for your purchasing power. Anyway, you can see, historically speaking, that in real terms, that housing has gone up and it has gone down. That was really a misnomer back in uh, 2004, 2005, how people were saying that housing prices had never gone down in the United States. Well, that may be true in nominal terms, but who really cares about that? What I really want you to pay attention to is this line right here. And this is the historic trend line. And this actually tracks all the way back to 1890. If you look at the case Schiller, uh, housing chart that goes back that far adjusted for inflation and back in 2012 I didn't have the luxury of seeing this upside right here we were right about here and in 2012 I took almost hundred percent of my life savings or my net worth and put it into real estate and I had confidence in doing that because I had studied the boom and bust in Japan with their real estate in the late 80s early 90s and I knew that they had gone down by about 60%. So right here, uh, peak to trough, we were down about 50% nationwide. So I thought, okay, well, <clears throat> comparing this to Japan, you know, I've got about 10% downside and we're right on this historic trend line. So, you know, how much downside could I possibly have? And back then they were just giving houses away. And everyone thought I was crazy for going into housing because everyone thought it was going to drop another 50%. Well, I was pretty confident that it wasn't. So I went in and bought everything I could. And as you can see, that turned out to be a good decision. But where is it now? Uh, if we take this 2014 chart, and if we take it to the current time, we're gonna be probably up in here. We're gonna be definitely higher on the nominal side, especially in the cyclical markets like the, the coast, New York, LA, or like Denver, something like that. Or even in real terms, we're going to be higher or we're going to be very, very close to where we were at the height of the bubble in 2006. So the question becomes, is real estate cheap in the United States or is it expensive? 
And the reason why I started off this example with telling you why I bought everything right here is because in my investment career, I've made money and I've lost a little bit of money. Fortunately, I've made a little bit more than I've lost. But every time that I've bought an asset when it's cheap or hated and uh, then sold it when it's expensive, and I, did I know when a top was? No. Did I know when a bottom was? No. I didn't try to guess the top and bottom. I just ask myself, is it cheap or is it expensive? And if it's cheap, I buy it. If it's expensive, I sell it. So right now, my point is that the uh, real estate in the United States is expensive. Right now, I am a seller of real estate in the United States. I am not a buyer. But let's look at Medellin. Number one, we know that the currency is extremely, extremely cheap. We know the dollar is, is not extremely expensive, but it is expensive. Now let's look at Latin America as a whole. And this is the average square meter selling price of an apartment select Latin American cities as of March, 2019. So very recent. We've got Buenos Aires and that's at uh, right around 3,100 a square meter. Uh, Santiago, 3,100. Going down to uh, Rio de Janeiro, we've got about 3,000. Going down here to uh, Mexico, 1600, Bogota, 1300, Quito, 1300. And keep in mind, Bogota is a lot more expensive than even Medellin. So uh, Medellin didn't even make the list. And I would guess on average, Medellin would be about maybe 1100. So you can see that relative to the rest of Latin America or the rest of the developing countries or around the world, the, the uh, the real estate in Medellin is extremely cheap, not to mention the peso being cheap. So how cheap is it? Let's go and use this calculator and go over a deal that I just did. In fact, I just closed on it the other day. And this was a 170 square meter apartment. And hopefully I can, that, that little green thing isn't going to block my calculator, but let's do the math here. I paid 375 million pesos, of course, okay, and it is 170 roughly square meters, it's actually a little bigger than that. So that gives my per meter purchase price at about 2.2 million pesos per square meter. Said another way, let's go ahead and divide that by the exchange rate, which is 3,200 roughly. And that gives us, a, a, in dollars, again, because we want an apples to apples comparison uh, with this chart, in dollars, I'm buying for right around $690 per square meter. Well, look at where that puts us on our chart here. I mean, <laughs> we're at uh, half of what the lowest in Quito, Ecuador is, and we're at half of that. So, and then putting this into terms that might be a little more understandable for people in the United States, uh, square meters, are they're roughly 10 times, a little bit more than 10 times uh, square foot. So that's like getting something for 60 to $70 a square foot in a, 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 a booming metropolis of 4 million people in the very, very, very best location that you can find. And I call that cheap. So that was number three on my list. Uh, let's move on to number four. And that's the leverage in the system or the amount of uh, credit that's in the real estate market. Now, th this is interesting because this gives us insight into not only the upside, but also the downside. And this is from a company that's uh, local here. And I don't know them real well, but uh, they do have some great information here. And they're referencing uh, Banco Colombia and a lot of great sources. So back in 2014, you can see that according to Banco Colombia, only 3% of adults in Colombia had a mortgage. 
3%. And I mean, let's say there's 50% of the people in the United States that own a home. Out of those, how much, you know, how many, uh, what percentage would have a mortgage? Let's say 95%. So that means that 40 to 45% of Americans actually have a mortgage, which sounds right. In Colombia, it's three. So that means there's very little credit in the system. And the people that do own apartments here or that do own homes, they own them outright. They do not have a monthly mortgage payment. So let's look at that on the downside. Well, how can you have a real estate bubble? How can you have a 2009 event in the Colombian real estate market when there's when no one has a mortgage payment? No one is forced to liquidate if they don't have a mortgage payment. That was the problem in 2007, 2008, 2009 in the United States. It's, it's not like everyone wanted to sell at the same time. It's everyone had to sell at the same time because they couldn't afford their monthly payment. So now, how does that affect the upside? So if only 3% of adults have uh, mortgages, well, let's say that number went up to 20, or let's say that number went up to 30%. Well, think about how much more affordable housing would become here for the average person. If it becomes more affordable, it increases the demand. If the supply stays the same, which it has to around the areas that I like, which we'll go into in just a moment, then the prices are gonna go much, much higher. So the lack of credit in the system not only limits your downside, but creates a scenario for your upside that is almost unlimited. All right, let's go on to, uh, and so just to reiterate, my fourth reason for buying Medellin real estate right now is the lack of credit that's currently in the Medellin housing market. Number five, last but not least, is the amazing opportunity for short-term rental here, more specifically Airbnb. And I realize that Sure, you can do Airbnb back in the United States, so this is not unique to Medellin, but this is really a, a booming business here. And with the increased tourism year over year, with Columbia kind of shedding that old uh, baggage of you know being looked at as a, a drug country or you know, Pablo Escobar, all that's completely nonsense. And for those of you who have actually been here, you know that it's the most you know, one of the safest, most friendly places that you could possibly come. So, and people are starting to realize that, and that's why the tourism is increasing so much. It's a three hour flight from Miami, for heaven's sakes. Perfect weather, perfect food, amazing people. And the cost of living is just next to nothing. So anyway, back to the Airbnb. This is about three, and this is this area, parking areas here, which I really like. This is where all the bars, the restaurants, the cafes. If you're familiar with uh, Phoenix as an example, this would be the equivalent of Old Town Scottsdale. So this is really where I like to be. I like to buy apartments that are within walking distance of Park Eros because it is impossible for them to create more supply here. On every single street, all you have is high-rise apartments. So there will never be another high-rise apartment built within walking distance of uh, Park Eros. And that's an absolute fact. Uh, just check out Google Maps if you or Google Satellite if you don't believe me. So we've got about uh, $300 a night here. We've got, uh, wow, $400 a night here. We've got uh, $100 a night here. We've got, uh, what's that, 250 a night here. Uh, we've got $1,000 a night <laughs> right here. I don't know what that place is, but 1000 a night. Um, this is probably a, you know an outrageous 10-bedroom penthouse. But even these at 300 a night are probably just, you know, really, really awesome three bed, maybe four bed, three bath, probably 2,000 square feet uh, and just really nice with a jacuzzi or an amazing uh, kitchen and just awesome, awesome location. So you can imagine spending, I mean, 175,000 all in once you've purchased a property and you've remodeled it, or let's just say 200,000 to uh, you know, use conservative numbers. So you buy an apartment right around this area, you remodel it, so you've got some built-in equity, you're buying an asset that's cheap and it's in a super cheap currency, and you're diversifying your portfolio, you're doing a lot of smart things here. And then in addition to that, you can get a 
plus percent return on uh, using it as a rental property, just doing Airbnb. And uh, I, I mean, and I say 20% plus, I know guys that are getting a lot more than that. So that's just a, a huge opportunity. And I know that you might be able to get some sort of return like that in the United States on Airbnb, but you're sure as heck not going to be able to do it and have a massive equity build by doing a remodel. And you're sure as heck not going to be able to do it. And uh, while at the same time, diversifying your portfolio out of the dollar into a currency that's extremely cheap. So let's reiterate here in closing, my number one reason to buy Medellin real estate now in 2019 is to diversify your portfolio when it comes to the currency that your assets are denominated in. So not to have 100% of your assets denominated in dollars. You've got maybe 30% in dollars, 30% in something else, and then you know 40% or, or whatever and something else. Or maybe I like to do a 50-50 split with pesos, but that's just me. The bottom line is making sure there's currency diversification within the assets in your portfolio. Number two is because right now the ROI on flips and uh, rentals here long term is superior to the United States if you on an apples to apples comparison, if you're not using leverage. Uh, number three is because it is dirt cheap right now. I don't know what people are talking about when they say that there's this, uh, you know, that the prices in Poblado are just way out of hand. I'm buying stuff for $700 a square meter for heaven's sakes. Show me how that is expensive. I'd love to debate any of those people. And the next reason uh, that would be number four is because there's very little credit in the system. So what that does is that really minimizes your downside and it makes your upside almost limitless when more people have more purchasing power and it's going to increase demand. Or if there is a downward trend in the housing market, people don't have to sell. Then lastly, we've got the short term rental and using Airbnb, huge opportunity here to get 20 or even a higher percent returns on a on an actual rental property. So those are my five reasons for investing in real estate in Medellin right now, 2019. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments. I'll do my very best to check those comments and to respond to your questions as soon as I can. If you like videos like this, uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or like the Facebook page that you saw it on. And I look forward to doing another video in the next couple days. Thanks a lot and uh, happy investing.